Um, I'm, I'm Ian Krop. I'm the um, CTO director here. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce David Rim, uh, who, as many of you know, is the Anthony Brady Professor of Pathology and Medicine here. Uh, he is a Hopkins alum, uh, did an MD-PhD there, uh, then came here for, for pathology residency, um, and uh, then did a cytopath uh, fellowship at the uh, Medical College of Virginia. Um, he's actually now been at Yale for almost 30 years. Um, that's impressive. Uh, he's the director of the pathology tissue service here and serves as director of translational pathology. Um, you know, I think David has been at the forefront of, I guess I don't need to, as in the forefront of uh, quantitative pathology um, for, for many years. Um, and he's well known throughout the, 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 um, uh, the field for this. Um, he developed many novel assay techniques for identifying predictive markers to determine which tumors are sensitive to which targeted therapies. And this has become increasingly important as the number of targeted therapies has increased and our use of those drugs has increased. Um, and today he's going to focus on the development of companion diagnostics for her two uh, directed therapies. I think this is particularly timely uh, as the first her two targeted therapy for non uh, fish amplified uh, breast cancers was just approved six months ago, and how exactly we identify which patients are going to benefit from uh, this therapy, I think, is a, is a huge question and one the field is struggling with. And David's made a lot of inroads into that, and I think he's going to focus on 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 that today. So thank you for uh, bringing this timely uh, discussion to us. Okay, uh, great. Um, thanks, Ian, and thanks to the leadership for inviting me today, but thanks especially for Ian for introducing me. He's a world leader in this space that I'm going to talk about, that is the HER2 uh, um, ADC or antibody drug conjugate space. Um, I'll start by, um, my title is pre Precision Medicine versus Persuasion Medicine, and I'll get to what persuasion medicine is a little bit more at the end, and reading versus measuring, and measuring is what you do quantitatively reading is what pathologists do when they look at slides and it's the difference between subjective and objective assessment of tissue. Um, let's see, I'll start with my disclosures. As you can see, I do a fair bit of consulting and uh, a lot of the research in my lab, including the work that led to this, most of what I'm gonna to present today uh, was sponsored by uh, companies, including Cepheid and Conic Minolta. So today I wanna to spend the next 55 minutes or so talking about first a quick introduction to the new drugs. If you've heard Ian speak, I don't need to give this part, but maybe you didn't. Um, a proposed new assay for these new drugs, uh, high sensitivity, we'll call the assay high sensitivity or HSR2, and then CAP-CLIA. What, what does it take to get something from your research lab so that into a lab where we can deliver information to patients and put the results in the patient's chart? That's what CAPCLIA is taking the new assay to the clinic. And then finally, I'll talk about precision medicine versus persuasion medicine and try to talk all of you who are oncologists in the room into not using persuasion medicine and focusing on precision medicine. So this is the, the big drug that got the first standing ovation in 25 years, as I understand, at ASCO. Um, and it, it's, it's the same old drug, it's trastuzumab underneath, but they've conjugated eight uh, topoisomerase inhibitor payloads to the uh, trastuzumab that gives you a spe some special tricks. First of all, it brings these highly toxic payloads right to the cell, so it doesn't have the toxicity that giving the drug and the dosages that it would be given um, cause all, would cause all kinds of toxicity. But if you bring it right to the cell, it causes less toxicity. Whereas if you, um, and not only that, when it gets uncoupled in the cell, it can spill out of the cell and kill neighboring cells. Uh, the, so, the, the sort of neighborhood effect or um, proximity effect of the therapy. It worked really well, and that's why we've all heard about it. Um, uh, the, you can see very few patients uh, were resistant, but most patients had some response, and there were 11 CRs in the early trials. Um, and in fact, it worked at for all patients, but especially in patients that were not amplified for HER2. So the initial trials were all in patients that had HER2 amplification, but then they started trials on patients with low HER2, IHC 2 plus and IHC 1 plus, and you can see the curves look pretty similar. And in fact, in those low, low patients in the DESTINY 4 trial, 
ultimately the survival curve looks like great, looks like this, which is really a great improvement in the survival curve for advanced breast cancer and changing uh, median survival from five to nine months. Uh, and that's, I think, what ultimately has led to the um, popularization of this drug and the success of the drug. Um, and they said, we concluded a randomized two-group open-label phase two trial with HER2 low. What does that mean? So that's what we'll like, examine the rest. But before we go there, what about HER2 zero? What about if they don't express any HER2 at all? And can we tell the difference between HER2 zero and HER2 low? And in fact, in HER2 zeros, in this, there is a trial going underway that's HER2 less than one, but greater than zero. That's the DESTINY6 trial, hasn't reported yet. But there's also the HER2 zero equals zero um, DAISY trial, which was a small trial in France, where there was clearly, in these waterfall plots, clearly patients that benefited from drug, even though they had a HER2 equals zero. So is this the, uh, why is it important to understand this and have good diagnostics for it? Because this drug is the tip of the iceberg. Here's a list of other drugs, which there's no way you can read, but all of these drugs are, are all these are targets for ADCs in clinical trials. So I think ADCs may become very important for oncology in the next few years, and equally important will be companion diagnostics that actually pick the right patients as opposed to giving the drug. Because unlike when we know the target so well, and we know how the drug works, it's really important to be able to pick the right target or to pick the right patients that express the right amount of target. So what do we do now? So this is the standard practice guidelines, the ASCO CAP guidelines from 2018. And these guidelines are how we practice as pathologists in assessment of HER2 expression. And this is the algorithm uh, for what we look at. When we look at the slide, circumferential staining that is complete, intense, and in greater than 10% of the cells, that makes a three plus. And then we have a two plus, one plus, I won't go through them all, but they're kind of summarized here where one, no staining, no membrane staining observed is a zero, plus one is faint partial membrane staining, and weak to moderate staining is plus two. But that's kind of subjective. In fact, how well can we do that? And how important is it? Well, it used to be important to tell the HER3s, the, the three pluses from the others, and the two pluses were the, the reflex. But now it's important to, to have this, cat, the new category is HER2 low. And how many are there? There's a lot. Uh, maybe as many as 65 or 70% of the patients are thought to fall into this low, to, HER2 low category, which means a lot of patients could get drug, but it also means that we need to be as accurate as we can in assigning those patients because we don't want the HER2 zeros to get the drug if they aren't going to benefit. Now, maybe we do. We'll talk about that later. But um, so how do we know, how, how well do we do at this HER2? So I'm fortunate to be on the immunohistochemistry committee of the College of American Pathologists. And so I get access to the surveys that make CLIA labs what CLIA labs are. That is for a CLIA lab or a clinical lab to return data to the chart, they have to do a survey twice a year to show that they're competent and effective at doing the assay. And here's the surveys for anatomic pathology for HER2 uh, using a tissue microarray. This is HER2A 2020. So it was the fall survey or the spring survey from 2020 from the College of American Pathologists. And you can see my colleagues here including myself, who are on this committee. And when we looked at these surveys, we noticed that four, six, and seven, that is three out of 10, did not reach consensus. That means that of the 1,400 labs in the, in the world that did this, they couldn't come to an agreement. That is, you need to have 90% consensus to have agreement. In fact, if we look at this one, it's interesting. This is one of the cases that didn't come to agreement. And that was because there was a, a big discordance in the number of called zero versus one, and there were a fair number that even called it two or three. So that's troublesome. If we're testing these labs twice a year and we're assuring that they're giving the right answer for the patients, how can you have that much difference between zero and one that it's almost 50-50? So since I, I'm on the CAP committee, I could ask for the data from the last few years. And here's the data from, the la from 2019 and 2020. And of the 80 cases, 15 of those cases showed a discordance of greater than 25%. And that's shown in these pie charts here, where the zeros are blue and the ones are red and anything higher than one is black, two and three, since we're not gonna focus on that. So we, we did, we thought, is this really, you know, this is concerning, but you know what? This is tissue microarrays. This is not what happens in the real world. So then we did a study of real world core biopsies and enrolled 18 pathologists from 15 institutions around the United States and asked them to read actual core biopsies that had been read at Yale. We collected 170 cases from Yale and had them score them according to the ASCO-CAP guidelines 
before the publication and the popularization of HER2 one plus versus zero. So they didn't know, they were just doing the ASCO cap guidelines as they always have and scoring zero, one, two, three. And what they did, what their scoring looked like was this, that is the blues were the zeros. This is the percent of pathologists that scored at zero. So a fair number agreed that, um, that there were zeros. There were 92 cases that were discordant. And of those 92, 69 uh, were discordant between zero and one, and only 20 were discordant between two and three. So this actually um, was through many reviewers, ultimately got us published in JAMA Oncology. Oops, how come it's not advancing now? Oh, hold on. I lost my laser pointer. Oh, Microsoft doesn't want me to do this. Now it's the screen has turned gray. Is it saying restart? I probably shouldn't, I should probably wait for the program to respond. Um, very sorry about this, but um, suffice it to say that I'll skip the next slide so we can keep going. Um, the next slide was after many review rounds of review, we did get this published in JAMA Oncology, but weren't allowed to say what we wanted to say, which is that there's really a great discordance between zero and one and not so much discordance between two and three. And I don't know if we have, should I restart the program? I don't know if we have any IT people here that or how long we're, you know, if we'll be here for the next 45 minutes waiting for the computer to come along. Wait to respond or restart the program. Maybe I should restart the program. Well, that will take several minutes too. Uh, it's just, it's just not rebooting the computer. It's just, yeah. It's okay. Let's try again. Yeah, we're good. We're good? Sorry about that. Okay, we saw all those things already. Um, let's go to the study that was in JAMA Oncology was here. And this is what was the, this is the figure. And, and Eileen Fernandez was the lead on this study in my lab. Uh, and she um, did the analysis that is shown here that shows that there's a lot more discordance between zero and one than there is between two and three. And for two, we have a solution. For two, we can do fish. So we have a orthogonal assay. What do we do between zero and one? Well, we don't have a solution yet. That's what I'll show you in a minute. But also you can look at this um, analysis, which, which shows you, this is uh, work done by Jack Robbins in the lab with Eileen Fernandez, showing the percentage of people that called zero versus called one. And so if you're pathologist number 18, and these are all currently signing out pathologists, most with more than five years of experience around the country. So these are not residents or not to say that residents can't do this just as well, but these are not residents or or, or laboratorians. These are sign out pathologists. And if your pathologist 18, you only score 15% of the patients with a zero. But if your pathologist number one, you have 44%. So whether or not you get trastuzumab drugs TCAN depends on who your pathologist is. That doesn't sound like a great idea to me. So what we asked is how many people do you need to make sure that an assay agrees with each other? And we, we invented this with Gang Han, we invented this system to realize that there's 21 thousand pathologists just in the US and a hundred thousand in the world. So how many do we need to decide whether or not an assay is good? And so we, there, there is actually no statistical method for this. So we simply decided to plot the overall percent agreement. That's what overall OPA stands for versus the observers or readers. And what you see is that the more observers you have, the less agreement you have, which makes sense. The more people you ask, the more discordance you're gonna get in your answers, just mathematical truism. And so does this actually work and can this be used to assess assays? So here's estrogen receptor. Turns out we're really good at estrogen receptor. If you have a quartet of pathologists read estrogen receptor, all four of them will agree somewhere between 85 and 95% of the time. How do we do for HER2? Well, not so well. This is the plot for HER2, three plus or not three plus. We're really good at that. But if you have a quartet of pathologists, four, decide whether it's zero or not zero, it's between 40 and 80%, 85%. So this is a new method to approach the analysis to try to figure out how many we need and how many do we need to make a new assay to make a good study? Well, it's when it plateaus. So in this case, we probably need nine or 10. Uh, in this case, no number is sufficient because it goes all the way down to the baseline to tell ones from not ones. So the point is, I think that I've, I hope that I've convinced you that we need a new assay. And so that's what we have done is propose a new assay that's measured, not read. And so based on that, 
we, st we started from the beginning with cell lines. And these cell lines are all cell lines that are amplified, gene amplified. And these cell lines are all gene uh, express HER2, but are not gene amplified. And you can see when you plot them, if you look with the current FDA approved assay, you can separate the highs from the lows or the negatives, but you can't stratify the negatives. Whereas if you do the new assay, high 10 times more antibody, pretty simple new assay, you can then stratify the low cell lines and tell the zeros from the ones essentially, if you were reading the cell lines. Um, but it was the wrong, the wrong, the current assay is the wrong tool for the job. Or as was said by uh, a group in France, the current assay now FDA approved is like weighing mice on a scale for elephants. And I think this is really good because everybody gets this. If you have a scale for elephants, it doesn't work for weighing mice. And it's all about dynamic range. So here's the assay we did, we invented. And, and this is to have a, a, a series of cell lines and then just do like a Bradford assay, like we all did in college chemistry for where we make a standard curve. And we used our a tissue microarray to make cell lines and with the help of array science made a standard curve. And then with the help of Protipio, we figured out how many atomoles per microgram there were in each of these cell lines and then converted that using QPath to how many atomoles per square millimeter there are. So now we have an assay that can tell us atomoles per square millimeter. And like all assays, it saturates when it gets too high. So the amplified cases are saturated and we can't use those. But since we don't really care about two plus and three plus, we got that. Pathologists can do just fine in telling three plus from not three plus. We need an assay to tell zero from one. And so that's this assay works fine. If we get rid of these two, we can now build a very nice standard curve that we can use as a linear assay and then assign each case in atomoles per square millimeter. And so just to remind you, I'm gonna talk a little bit about limits of detection, limits of quantification and limits of linearity, a little bit of assay terminology. And, we, and this is the range we wanna be in, not this range, which is what the saturation range, which is what the current assay uh, really focuses on. Because really the current assay, all you need to tell is, is it saturated or not? For the new assay, we need to tell how much they have. So here's our, the current, our standard curve with the high HER2 assay. And you can see there's two positives and the rest are negative. So it works if you just wanna tell amplified from non-amplified. But what if you want to tell that low range? So you can see that you can see the full dynamic range with the new HER2 low assay antibody concentration or what we're calling high sensitivity HS HER2, you can see in that range. So now we have to talk about a little bit of wonky stuff. And that is what are those things? So what is the limit of detection? What is the limit of quantification? And what is the limit of linearity? So these are the definitions. And this is right out of the FDA's handbook on how they advise industry to do this. And you can see that uh, the limit of detection is the lowest concentration of the analyte that can be detected but not but and reliably distinguished from zero, but not necessarily quantified. That is too low. So what we really want is to know the limit of quantification because then we can do it right every time. But we don't yet know how much HER2 is required to benefit from trastuzumab drugs TCAN. So we're going to measure all the way down to beyond the limits of our assay to, to the LOD and below and see what we get. And what we got is this, when we did it on a tissue microarray, we could see that the, the zeros are blue, the reds are one, ones are red, the twos, this is the pathologist read over here, two plus is black and three plus is green. And most of the greens are above our limit of linearity. But look at how many twos and ones there are in this middle range that would be called one. And I think this is even further evidence that we need a, a quantitative assay. We need a measured assay, not a red assay, in order to pick the right patients for trastuzumab drugs TCAN. And surprisingly, there are some patients, most of whom were called zero, but some were called one or two, that are actually below our limit of quantification or even below our limit of detection, as I'll show later. So then we did what you have to do in a CLIA lab is did 40, uh, you have to do 20 positives and 20 negatives, according to Fitzgibbons et al, in order to bring your assay to the CLIA lab. But we don't have positives and negatives, we have a continuous scale. So we did 40 of them. And these are actual core biopsies now, they're not tissue microarrays. But you can see the same thing. There's a fair bit of misassignment. And in fact, summarized here, you can see that there's zeros and ones, but there's a broad range of atomoles per square millimeter for zeros and ones. And the two plus not amplified almost, in fact, does um, overlap with the two plus amplifieds and the three pluses, which we're good at and we're pretty tight. So how many are there? Well, in our first 40, there was about 20% of the cases 
that appear to be below the limit of quantification for HER2 protein, uh, but potentially present and as target uh, for a target for TDXD. So just to summarize to this point, about 70% of the cases have low HER2 defined as above the LOQ and below the levels associated with gene amplification. About eight to 10% are below our LOQ or even our LOD. It's probably about 6% below our LOD. Many of the cases that are called HER2 zero, as many as 60% or in our studies, maybe 75% have detectable amounts of HER2 between three and 20 animals. And the quantitative HER2 assay could be envisioned as a reflex text. So that if you, a pathologist reads an IHC equals zero, they could then reflex to the quantitative test in the same way we reflex to fish today for a two plus uh, IHC. Okay, so that's the proposed new assay. Now let's take it to the clinic. So what's involved in the next step of taking to the clinic? And I like to quote a colleague of mine from Brigham and Women's who said, once you have the assay working in your research lab, you're 5% of the way there. And I think that's really true now having brought this assay um, with hats off to um, Trish Gall, who's not here and has now left, Nay Chan, who's in the audience, and Riva Kaimova, who have helped me to bring this assay to the uh, clinical setting. So the things that you have to do are antibody titration, maximization of signal to noise, analytic validation. I'll try to go through this stuff fast because it's a little on the wonky side. Performance, accuracy, precision, sensitivity, and specificity, and serial core reproducibility. And then how do we tell our colleagues? How do we tell the oncologists? And then, so the reporting is part of this as well. So first of all, we looked at the signal to noise and you can see that the peak signal to noise is at one microgram per mil for a new antibody. This is a new higher sensitivity antibody for HER2 than the one that's currently used in the clinic. And we took and we picked the concentration with the maximal signal to noise. And then we looked at the accuracy and our accuracy isn't great. It's only 87%. Why is that? That's because we're more sensitive than the status quo assay, which we had to compare it to, which is IHC 0, 1, 2, and 3. Um, but overall, um, we have uh, quite, a, quite good concordance, especially in the, and, and more resolution in the low range. And then our intra and intra assay precision is quite high. 10% sounds like it might not be great for intra assay precision. And actually, the assay that we just bridged to, we're now under 10%, but it's acceptable. And the intra assay precision, this means um, to calculate the precision, three slides run on separate trays of the same machine is, is, is about 5%. So these are where we want to be. Our sensitivity compared to the historical assay is 100%, and our specificity is 84%. Why is our specificity low? Because we're more sensitive. And so we call cases positive that were called negative by IHC. So here's the proposed clinical future work, uh, workflow. And this is what we're doing now, which is we have, uh, we get the labs come to this lab that I call the QDAP lab, Quantitative Diagnostics and Anatomic Pathology, which is a new lab, which is now open and open for business. And we've now begun uh, to do this. This is, and this is QDAP assay number one, the high sensitivity HER2. We batch the stains and do them in our Leica bond stainer so that they're done in an auto stainer. And then we read them originally in some old like legacy hardware, but now we're using this. Uh, we just recently completed the Bridges study, although our license holder hasn't signed off yet. He will see it shortly um, and uses a much more high throughput device. Instead of an hour, this machine would take about four minutes to scan a slide. So we wanted to uh, update our technology a little bit. And then we sign it out in Copath as a procedure um, and so it ultimately makes it to EPIC and, and clinicians can see it. This is what it looks like. The pathologist has to pick a region. So we're actually not measuring the entire core biopsy. We're measuring a region that is quote unquote representative. And that representative region is then looks like this. This is actually not a brown stain, but a pseudo IHC, which it shows the pathologist what, they, what it looked like. And then the pathologist actually sees the number of fields of view, in this case, 23. And the uh, in this case, the uh, rare site score in this case was 15.4 atomoles per square millimeter. So that will be included in the report. We'd say 15.4 atomoles per square millimeter. We don't know what that means. Uh, we, we do know that it's detectable. And then we can give a choice in our interpretation that it's positive for expression high. That is, it's above our limit of linearity. Positive expression intermediate, which means that it's like a one or a two. Positive for expression low, which means it's present, but it might not be reproducible. Uh, that is, it's above our LOD, but not necessarily above our LOQ, and then negative, below the LOD. And so these are the reports that we'll issue uh, as, as we start to receive specimens. 
So far, we've received a grand total of two. Um, we hope that after this talk and maybe in the future, and certainly in the more distant future, when we know uh, how much is necessary for patients to respond, uh, we hope that this assay will gain some traction. So our vision, we currently offer HSR2 in the QDAP lab. Uh, tests must be requested by an oncologist and the patients are billed if the test is requested by an oncologist. Um, there are ICD-9 codes for all the stuff we're doing. We began a prospective study on all breast biopsies so that we have data of a year's worth of prospective data and we're about seven months into it now. Um, <clears throat> we offer the assay clinicians from to Yale or elsewhere who want quantitative information, but only two so far to date. And then uh, the discussions of the license, we, what we hope to happen is ultimately, it won't just be Yale that can do this, but we'll license it to some of the big lab companies that provide them the bulk of the service. It's interesting to know, and uh, interesting to me anyway, that uh, only 15% of lab tests in the US are provided by academic labs. The other 85% are provided by private labs. And so clearly if we wanna have this affect uh, patients around the world and be useful, it needs to make it into private labs. And those discussions are beginning. So the last thing I wanna talk about is um, the precision versus persuasion medicine. And so our original envision for this assay was that we would need to adjudicate that IHC is equal zero. And what we would do is we would get all the IHCs equal zero and we would measure them. And then we tell you if you're above the limit of detection or above the limit of response. We don't know the limit of response yet. Someday we will, and I'll show you how we intend to get there. But right now we don't know the limit of response, but we would take all the cases that were called IHC zero and maybe the cases that were called IHC one and do that. But something happened in the last three or four months. And I haven't been able to document it yet, probably because it's not mature enough, but suddenly the IHC equals zero is rare. And that's because pathologists are people too. Pathologists sometimes might be a little more lenient on what they call IHC one in this co-called sympathy vote because then they can get this new drug. Here are real quotes that I've heard. I won't quote the people because to not embarrass them or give them credit, but here's a real quote. Hi, Dr. Pathologist. So I see you called Mrs. X's biopsy IHC zero. That means I'm gonna have to offer her brain radiation. Are you sure it's not IHC equals one? Then I could give her a hurt and her two. Hmm. Should I go look at that slide again? Does that mean that my first view of that slide was not accurate? Or was it accurate? And maybe I should change my diagnosis because I'm persuaded that that's better for the patient. I'm not sure that's a great idea. From West Coast Director of Pathology Service, yeah, we don't have many IHCs equal zero anymore. And from a Midwestern oncologist, I'm not seeing the response rates in HER2 patients that they saw in the clinical trial. They're getting a lot of IHC zeros. And maybe IHC zeros really don't respond. We know that eight to 10% of the cases really don't express any target. And this is a targeted therapy. I mean, we don't definitively know how the drug works, but we think it's a targeted therapy. After all, it's trastuzumab conjugated to toxins. So what's happened is that Really now we need to adjudicate the one pluses. What we really need because the zeros have minimized, not, I don't want to say they've gone away. And if you ask pathologists, they will sternly tell you, yes, of course, we still call IHC zero. But data will, set, will, will tell us in a year or so from now how our IHC zero calls changed. But, um, but IHC one is now more common. And so if it's, if it's more common, maybe that's the one we should be measuring. And in fact, that's the plan. So there are a few different ways we're gonna study IHC equals one. The first is the QDAP Labs prospective study. And this is um, uh, co-PI'd with me by Nate, uh, by Nate Chan, who's the director of the QDAP Lab. And you can see we began August one and we'll go till July, 2023. And today we have 226. I anticipate we'll get around 400. Um, the inclusion criteria will be any case. And the primary objective will be to determine the number of IHC zero cases that have detectable HER2 expression. So how many IHC zeros, and this study was designed before everything became IHC one, but how many IHC zeros have above the limit of detection and how many IHCs ones have below the limit of detection will be interesting as well. That's a secondary, um, that's a secondary objective of the study. And the study is in process. And we, I'll, just to show you a peek, we've already started doing some quantitative work and in fact, you can see um, from quantitative, this is quantification of prospective 
uh, tissue from the clinical trial. And you can see uh, the LOL in this case was 33 and the LOD is three. Um, on, this is all done on the new platform. And you can see that there's a lot of cases that are called zeros that are above our limit of detection. There's not as many so far, it looks like we're gonna not have very many that are below our limit of detection, but time will tell as we get, as the study matures. There's two other studies that we're progressing on. One is a TBCRC study proposal with Ian and Eric's arrival at Yale, we became part of the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium, which is a group of 16 or 17 now uh, institutions that do studies together on translational research. And the goal of this study that is still in proposal stage is to evaluate HER2 measurement in the one plus metastatic cases. So if we get one pluses and we get two or 300 from 17 institutions around the country, we should be able to tell how frequently we see the patients that have one plus actually don't have any target and vice versa, we should be able to see response since all those patients, since they were called one plus, will be get drug, will be getting trastuzumab drug secan and be present in the residency. So here's the study, a draft of the study objectives to evaluate the real world relationship between quantitative HER2 expression, QIF, and objective response in patients with HER2 IHC plus one and metastatic breast cancer receiving TDXT. And then there's a number of secondary objectives that are shown here as well. Um, and then a second study that I, I don't even have a slide for yet is that we've proposed a study um, led by uh, Miriam Lesberg here of patients who get IHC zero, uh, and then prospectively um, giving them TDXD much the way the DAISY trial worked. Um, that study is not yet uh, completely designed and not yet completely approved. So I don't have any slides to discuss it, but I think those are the kinds of studies we need where we have patient response, uh, either real world patient response or clinical trial patient response in order to figure out the atomals per square millimeter above which patients benefit. Will it be a cut point? Probably not. Probably there will be patients with high atomals per square millimeter that still don't benefit because there are other mechanisms of resistance. And, I have, and one of the interesting topics that many labs are working on, including my own, are what are the mechanisms of resistance beyond just not enough HER2 present. And hopefully uh, next year or a couple of years from now, I'll come back to you at Grand Rounds and talk about mechanisms of resistance and a more complex assay that also doesn't just assay HER2, but maybe assays other biomarkers that are associated with resistance or other drugs. And in fact, the HER2 trope 2 assay is well along its way. So we can help clinicians decide between sesotumumab govitecan, which is a trope 2 targeting therapy versus trastuzumab drextecan. So for that, my, my last slide, uh, overall HSHER2 assay is an LDT, a lab developed test and not FDA approved. So if you only do FDA approved tests, you probably don't do them here since most of our assays are LDTs, but we do have uh, a few FDA approved assays and many FDA approved assays, people don't realize this, but being on the CAP committees, you realize this. If you change one step of the protocol of your FDA approved assay, it is then an LDT and you must thus validate it. And so most assays we do are not FDA approved. We might use FDA approved reagents, but most assays we do are actually LDTs in our lab and in all the labs around the world. And that also applies for um, molecular assays, uh, gene mutation assays. Many of those assays are also not FDA approved assays, but rather LDTs. HSR2 assay is in the correct dynamic range. That is, we're not weighing elephants on, uh, or weighing mice on a scale built for elephants. The level of target required for trastuzumab drugs TCAN is still unknown. And I speak here before you, and I don't wanna to try to hide that from you. I think it's very clear that we don't know the answer to this question yet. But if we waited until we knew the answer to the question before we started the assay, we would be years behind. As it's this assay, we've been working on this assay for a couple of years now uh, to get it to the point that it's at. And so now that we have the tools, I am ask the oncologists in the audience, ask for measurements, not for readings, and please, don't ask the pathologist to change their minds. That's persuasion medicine, not precision medicine. And we all respect our pathology colleagues. And I think we all, you know, I know that oncologists really think highly of most of the pathologists they work with. And I think that they don't realize that when they do pers persuasion medicine, that it's actually not what the pathologist wants to hear. They don't want to be second guessed. They want to, if, if, if we're giving you a reading, we're giving you a reading. We really believe that's right. And just like you shouldn't go back on the test and change your answer, don't change your answer. It's 
if, if that was your first impression, it's probably your true impression and probably your best reading. And so with that, I just wanna thank the people in the lab that do all the work, I get to talk about it, but it's really a crew of people that do all the stuff that I told you about. Um, I especially like to point out Mirto Matafi, who started, the, who started building this uh, assay in the lab uh, over two years ago now, and then uh, my Yale collaborators and funding sources, et cetera. And then here's the, the, the key group at our last holiday party, um, our lab group, Aileen has now left. She was involved in a lot of the analytics stuff. Matt Liu helped out with some of the uh, analytics stuff as well. And then and Jack and uh, Katie weren't at the party, so they got their picture separate here. So with now, I've also left about 20 minutes for questions, if there are questions. Thank you very much. So we have four questions in the chat. Maybe while you're warming up, should I start with those? Oh no, there's only two. What about discordance with pathologists reading the same slides after a washout period? So Manju Prasad, a esteemed pathologist in our department, asks a very pivotal question. That is, when you're doing any kind of pathologist study, when you read it once, if you're gonna read it again, you should have a washout period. That is so you don't remember that case. Because surprisingly, pathologists have a really good memory for what the morphology of cases look like. And they can also remember the patient's name on the label. Um, and so, a lot of studies have a washout period. We didn't need a washout period in this study because they only saw the slides once. So if we're going to show them to them again, and if we're going to do any kind of intra-observer reproducibility, which we didn't do, and some other studies have done, we would need a washout period. But in this case, a washout period was not required. And then uh, Timothy Robinson asks, is heterogeneity within the tumor an important issue? Is it more important to, to do a small percentage of cancer cells that express a high amount of HER2 or is it more important to know that a high number of cells express at least the minimum amount of HER2? Wow, phenomenal question. That's Jack's three, that's his thesis project. Um, I think that's a great question. We obviously don't know the answer. All the pathologists in the audience know that HER2 is very heterogeneous. Uh, not only is it heterogeneous from within a slide, but it's heterogeneous between cuts. And all the pathologists in the audience know that when we sample one core biopsy, that's less than 1% of the tumor. And so there's no way for us to actually answer that question about true heterogeneity of the patient's tumor. But what we can, we can ask about heterogeneity on the slide, and we can and are asking that question, that is how important is high expression in a single cell versus high expression in the average cell? We started with the average, we have to start somewhere. Um, and I don't know that the average is a correct answer. You could argue because of the bystander effect of TDXD, it's actually the highest ones that make the most difference. Um, but we don't know that. Uh, that's just speculation at this point. Let's see. Um, now it's your turn. That's a great question. So as soon as I had the assay built, I applied for tissue from AstraZeneca Dicisenko from the Destiny 4 trial and was rapidly told I would never see that. Um, and it's, I don't fault them for that. They have their own people that can do quantitative work and they have an FDA approval for IHC 0123. So they don't wanna have to change their FDA approval. They're making a lot of money on this drug and it would be detrimental to the shareholders of that company to have me have access to that tissue. My question was, how much heterogeneity do you see in the atomal expression because you're taking so many fields of view and taking an average? Do you see a lot of heterogeneity there or is it? Yeah, we do. So that's a great question, um, Uma. The heterogeneity within a core biopsy is quite substantial. And as you know, when you read them, you see bright areas and not so bright areas. Right. And you know, how do we handle that? Well, someday, We'll know how, you know, whether it's the highest cell or the average cell or the lowest cell that's most important for response to trastuzumab and droxtecan, but we don't know that yet. And so in the same vein of, okay, we're just going to take a core biopsy and say that that represents the whole tumor, we're going to just take the average and say that that represents the expression of HER2. And the second question more for the clinician. We see situations with heterogeneity where we have a clear three plus tumor where the patient gets, you know, trastuzumab and there's complete response. And there's another tumor, which was HER2 negative and was zero or, you know, one plus, which didn't respond. So what 
will these patients benefit from a second round of TDXT or when they have two distinct uh, HER2 profiles? To... Maybe Ian can use the microphone since there's 71 people online. Yeah, and I, I, but I, I do want to clarify the question because I mean, we wouldn't use, um, we wouldn't have used a standard HER2 therapy if they were one plus. Do we use HER2 therapy? I mean, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it depends on the clinical situation. Um, we know pretty clearly now that with before, you know, with the previous generation of HER2 therapies that you do not see any benefit with uh, non HER2 3 plus or amplified cancer. So the HER2 lows do not respond to the previous generation, any of the previous generation of HER2 therapies. So, but with now with trastuzumab deruxtecan, you know, I think you could, you know, make a case that, um, you know, you might, you would see, you potentially could see benefit both in the clearly amplified and the HER2 lows. Um, but um, prior to that, we would look at a case like that on a case-by-case -case basis and say, well, let's use the HER2 therapy to get rid of the usually more aggressive HER2, HER2 positive cancer, and then we'll worry about the HER2 negative or HER2 low cancer later. Um, but it's, it's you know, again, the, the field is evolving now that we have these drugs that work across uh, different levels of HER2. I mean, getting to, in your earlier point, the, the two questions were brought up about HER2 heterogeneity, and I think that's really interesting. Again, with the first generation HER2 therapies, it was very clear. Uh, we actually did a prospective, big prospective trial um, with with the other, the first antibody drug conjugate that doesn't have bystander effect. And in that study, a heterogeneous cancer responded much wor much less um, effectively to a heterogeneous cancer than it did to a non-heterogeneous cancer. And and quantitatively, the the to your specific question, what mattered was the percent of HER2 negative cells, not the intensity of HER2 uh, on uh, uh, cells. Again, with a, a drug that has bystander effect, as, as I think David was alluding to, that might be switched. And maybe just if you just need to have a certain number of HER2 strongly positive cells to get the drug in, and then the, and then the bystander effect will take care of the HER2 negative cells. We like to test that prospectively, but we haven't had the funding yet to do that trial. Yeah, and I enjoy your talk, David. Uh, is any do you have any information the conjugate drug can get activated in the extracellular and micro environment of a tumor cell? So I I would again defer to Ian, who's much more of an expert on this than I am. But it's my understanding that the drug once it comes off, it has to be cleaved inside the cell. But once it comes off, it survives in the extracellular environment, and that's how the bystander effect works. That's how it can kill neighboring cells. Well, bystander effect doesn't really require to go into the cells. As long as it's uh, uh, present in the microenvironment of the tumor cell in an enriched fashion, you, you will have some activities. Well, the drug is an inhibitor of topoisomerase. So it has to get to the nucleus somehow, I guess, to have its yeah, effect. Yeah, but you can get activate outside of the cells. You don't have to take antibody to go inside the cells. Right, so but, the, 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 but the antibody doesn't necessarily take, it, the, the drug, I guess, can get into cells without the antibody. But the reason they conjugate it to antibody is so you can increase the dose locally to the tumor. Yeah, as long as we, in the microenvironment, we have a more protease type uh, to break up the linkage between conjugate, a uh, drug and the conjugate. Oh. That'd be fine. So then that, that means uh, you read, that could partly explain why the, uh, the heterogeneity potential difficulty uh, involvement, as well as you may have another interesting parameter <clears throat> to assess. Now the day with a, uh, Mass spec, we could look into whether there's an enriched 
do you conjugate drugs? Right. In, in, in that case, you would argue that it work it would work without trastuzumab even being present. You could you get the deconjugation even if there's no target present. Yeah, that's that's why you get an active. Right, yeah. without right, without HER2 present. If if the if, if it's a true HER2 zero, the drug could still work yeah. because it could get deconjugated and be effective everywhere in the body, anywhere in the exercise micro environment have enriched that particular. Yeah, you know, I, I think that you know the the question is the toxicity then, and that's actually the problem. I didn't go into that, but one of the problems with this drug is it has pulmonary toxicity in that patients get interstitial lung disease about 10% of the time. And that's another reason why you need a companion diagnostic. And one wonders if perhaps the interstitial lung disease is due to extra, you know, extracellular environment cleaving the drug, uh, even in the absence of HER2. Although we've also found that HER2 is present in normal airways at about the level it is in low, in uh, low in about at about a quote unquote one plus level or between four and six atomos per square millimeter. 